Bora TV. The world is thinking. So we'll start do, do, with a case study of a company uh, that many of you may have heard of, which is Microsoft. You've all heard of Microsoft. Some of you have been forced to use Microsoft products against your will, and yet. Um, you know, an amazing company. You may remember back in the mid-90s that Microsoft was the undisputed king of the hill, having successfully pummeled the heck out of people like IBM and Apple and Oracle for dominance of the computer desktops, so much so that they aroused the suspicions of the Justice Department. And it was at that moment when they were the undisputed leader that they looked around and they saw a threat that they had not counted on before. And that threat came in the form of the Sony PlayStation 2. Now, now, the PlayStation was a game console, and up until this time, game consoles were just that. They were games, they were toys, things for you know, folks to, to play with. But this promised to be something entirely different. You see, the PlayStation 2 was going to have an internet connection so you could browse the web on it, and it was going to have a DVD player in it so you could watch movies on it. It promised to become the kind of digital entertainment hub of the household. And you can see how this scared Microsoft to death because they said, wow, we have worked so hard to own the personal computer, and now here's this other thing that might completely eradicate the need to buy a personal computer at all. And so they knew they needed to do something different about this. And so they thought about it, and they argued about it, and they wrote position papers on it. And they finally decided that they had no other choice except for to come up with a game console of their own. Microsoft was going to create a game console. And the challenge for doing that for a company like Microsoft cannot be understated, right? Because it is true that theologians all agree that Microsoft is indeed richer than God. Nevertheless, Right? Microsoft was a, is a software company and knows very little about hardware. And in fact, Microsoft knows everything about the world of work and the world of the office um, and knows nothing about the world of play and home and things that we actually want to do and love to do. And so they knew they had to do something different. And so they got together a team of people, many of whom had not worked at Microsoft previously, folks who loved to play video games. And they put them off site in a separate building from the rest of the company. And they said, go ahead, break the rules, come up with an amazing game console. It doesn't matter if this thing works you know, with Windows. It doesn't matter if we can't show PowerPoint on it. Just come up with something uh, amazing. And so that's what those folks did. They worked at it for about two years. Uh, and they came up with something that was just fueled by their passion because they loved to play video games. Now, I should say, these folks didn't just love to play any kind of video game. They loved the kind of, how do I put it, the sort of rated M for mature video games that we don't like our kids playing. You see, most of the folks who love this thing loved it because um, they were the kind of 35-year-old man boy who had been playing video games since they were 12 and would get all out of their aggressions because after getting beaten up in junior high, they would come home and play on this video game, right, and shoot each other and kill each other. And the more violence and blood and guts, the happier they were. I mean, they would love to travel to distant planets and meet new alien species and kill them, right? And this is how they just showed how tough and hardcore they were. And they looked at the Sony PlayStation thing and they said, this is fine if you want to romp through some magical fairy forest collecting mushrooms and talking to Smurfs, <laughs> but that's not what we're going to do. We're going to make something tough. So that's what they did. And they worked for about two years on it until finally they launched what became known uh, as the Microsoft Xbox. And the Xbox was an overnight sensation. In its first incarnation, it sold 24 million units worldwide. Its signature game, Halo, which was one of those scary first-person shooter games, was sold out for weeks. And most importantly, this was the first successful game console by an American manufacturer in a generation. Can anyone remember the last American game manufacturer? Uh, wow, well, yeah, several years, Atari, right? If you remember Atari, you are old. <laughs> I mean, guys, I mean, like, your kids, your grandkids, they do not remember Atari. That was a generation ago. The business press had said that this was a, a, a place where only Japanese could compete. Americans had no business even trying to, uh, to play in this place. So it was a huge achievement, right, that Microsoft could come up with a game console to, to, to enter a market that they were not in, that was not their strength, and compete with Jap Japanese manufacturers. So excited was Microsoft with this that they decided that they knew exactly how to compete with other companies when they were faced with the next threat that came their way, and that was in, in the form of the Apple iPod. Right? 
The iPod came out in the fall of 2001, and it sold about 60 million units uh, in its first five years. And Microsoft looked at this thing, and they said, ha, we know exactly what to do. So they got together a team of people. They put them off-site. They said, go ahead, break the rules, come up with really something amazing. Just go kick butt, and that's exactly what they did. The team worked for about a year and a half, two years, and they finally came up with something called the Microsoft Zune. Has anyone heard of the Zune? <laughs> it's interesting. The Zune was slow. It was clunky. It was hard to use. As one reviewer said, the process of installing a Microsoft Zune on your computer is about as pleasurable as having an airbag explode in your face. <laughs> How's that for a review? And not surprisingly, in its first 18 months, the Zune sold about 2 million units worldwide. Now, to give you some scale of numbers for that, 2 million units in 18 months, in that same 18 months, Apple sold in excess of 84 million iPods. Yes, that is, in my business, the technical term for that is getting your butt kicked, right? <laughs> getting your hat handed to you, right? And in the work that I do, we're fascinated by this. And how did this happen? How was it that in one case, right, Microsoft was able to put together a group of people and do something amazing and different, like Xbox, and in the other case, the same company, in a similar competitive position, using the same techniques, fell flat on their face with, with Microsoft Zune. And so we looked at this, and we looked at the data, and we looked at through what had happened, and we, looked, we, we saw the product development timelines. We spent time interviewing people up in Redmond, Washington, trying to understand the forensics of the situation, trying to understand what the difference was between Xbox and Zune. But over and over again, something became very clear to us. People told us again and they, again, they said, you know, the biggest challenge uh, with Zoom was figuring out who we were making this for because we were relying on PowerPoint and charts and data. And in the case of Xbox, we didn't need all that because we knew those guys. Hell, we were those guys.